Okay, well, what I'm going to do next with the attention reading, it was pretty long, and you talked about a lot of different aspects of marginalized people, but I want to focus specifically on the ones that came in lecture, came up in lecture, which were the, uh, the Boone Rackerman, the Ainu, the Zaini too, which we talked about, about a little bit also, and the Okinawans. Um, so that's uh, section 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and 2.5. So um, I'm going to split up into four groups and have you look at just um, the section, one, one group for each, each uh, ethnicity. All right, well, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I'm worried about time. So let's go ahead and uh, get back together and talk about it. Um, so we can start over here with the first group in the Burakameen. So in, why why are why is this group discriminating on the basis? Because they have the shares of great bigger animals. Right. And so, um, in in what way are they kind of a threat to this idea of pure Japanese? Mm-hmm. Okay. And. And is there anything ironic about that or contradictory? We were just talking about how it's, it's kind of, it's, it's really ironic because it's a complete social construct because they are ethnically Japanese. Right. And we were, trying, we were discussing whether or not like, them being a, treated as a separate ethnicity makes the Japanese society feel that it's more pure or if it, it like takes away from the homogeneity because mm -hmm. even though they're ethnically Japanese, they Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Did you come to any conclusion? Or? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I find this um, one of the especially interesting parts because, you know, they are ethnically Japanese. They're just from certain villages that have been associated with these impure, rather than like the idea of mixed race children, which is the idea of like you're ethnically impure. Here they're ethnically pure, but they're associated with impure. Um, functions of society, so it's really kind of. I don't know if you said that they are in a way that like they don't see the same thing. So there's something, like she says, something that they have to look for. Right. Kind of something that they need to define themselves against. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, and then what about the Ainu? What did you find interesting in the article? And also, if there's any points which you say, well, I kind of disagree with Henschel on that, feel free to bring that up, too. But. Well, um, one interesting thing we thought was that part of the reason that I knew um, our threat to Japanese purity is that they're almost more pure. Mm -hmm. So they're, while they're called primitive, they also have much stronger links to the beginning of um, society than the Japanese do. And with such a focus on tradition and history as is in Japan. I sort of think that the claim of the Ainu is being linked to the Jomon, Jomon people mm -hmm. and their um, they're more their less tenuous links to the past kind of create make them more racially pure. Mm -hmm. And then Valerie brought up the idea of land. You know, mm -hmm. saying um that like one reason why Japanese see them as such a big threat might be because since they've been around for so long, they kind of have a they have more like stake and more clean in the land and right. and um, I guess the Japanese see that as a threat and I think that also shows especially when like the whole assimilation policy like one reason why they actually wanted to assimilate the Ainu was because they wanted to take back Hokkaido mm -hmm. so I feel like um, like together with the idea that like, they're more pure and together with the idea that like, they actually can have more clean in the land when the Japanese see them as a threat and then they like institute all these policies to try and like I guess uh, make them more inferior. Right. And it's interesting how in these situations, not just in Japan but in others, they always pass these laws that sound, you know, like the Ainu Protection Act or something like that, when it's kind of the opposite of what they're actually doing. Um, but, and I thought that was also a good point, the idea of them being seen as primitive, because remember, way back at the beginning of the semester, we read the um, uh, Morris Suzuki article, which is actually a footnote in here about this idea of, you know, it's not until you develop this idea of history proceeding and developing on a certain course towards modernity that you can 
see people who live at the exact same time as you as somehow being behind you in time, even though you're living at the same point in this idea of primitiveness, which uh, is definitely a part of it with the uh, case of the Ainu. So. And that's partly why it's ironic, because right. tradition, or things that are part of Japan today, like for example, we talked about how the Kamui are probably forerunners to the Kami. Right. And like even today, there's so much almost unconscious worshipping of the Kami, like with the wish trees and the, mm -hmm. the um, papers tied on. And so I just sort of thought that that's pretty ironic. Right, yeah, and he makes the point that everyone's like, oh, well, it must have come from Japanese into Ainu, but mm -hmm. the evidence seems to point the other way. So. Okay, good. And then uh, what about the uh, Koreans in Japan? We already talked about this a little bit, but what did you find um, new insights from this article that maybe you didn't get from the story? I felt like uh, the, the big problem was that because they've been so antagonistic historically, combined with the fact that like, they look the same, or very similar, or, like if they didn't look so much the same, like able to pass as Japanese, sort of, mm -hmm. or if they hadn't been so historically antagonistic, it wouldn't have been an issue, but like the two combined made it like, a problem. How how is the being able to pass make it a problem instead of less of a problem? I think it's because they perceive it as like a threat because like they don't know they're getting influence, but then when they find out, they take it as like kind of an offense. Like, oh, Korean. They've had such a rocky background that they right. automatically have this consciously, unconsciously, like they have uh, still bitter feelings. Like right. it's just been passed down, and since we're still like not that like far along in like passing over this history that mm -hmm. like it's still in the back of some people's minds. Right. Um, but actually what I kind of found interesting was uh, Henshaw was saying on uh, page 64 um, he kind of declares that well the way he thinks <coughs> that even if you're born in Japan and Korean you're not Japanese which is kind of interesting because it says um, Koreans have become more positive about the Korean origins just talking about Japan born Koreans mm -hmm. not content to hide their background and pretend to be Japanese as so many of their elders have done, they are probably displaying their own ethnicity without asserting it aggressively. Mm -hmm. So he's saying that, like, even though they're Korean, I, even though they're born in Japan, they're not Japanese, which I don't know if I necessarily agree with, because right. I, I consider myself American because I was born in America. Right. So that's not that yeah. And well, to what to what extent is um, does being born in America make you American in a way that being born in Japan doesn't make you Japanese? Yeah. If you're born in America, you're granted citizenship right, right. Away. Whereas you can be born in Japan and not get Japanese citizenship. So that's one big, one big point. Yeah, yeah that's something else that was kind of interesting is that the government doesn't really help like the relations between like Koreans and Japanese because they don't have citizenship. They are like rejected welfare and other governmental like support problems. So that right. just like kind of sets a sets a tone for the community of like what the government believes as well. So. Mm -hmm. What, what, did you find anything else that's ironic about this idea of Koreans being a threat to Japanese purity when they're ethnically very similar? Well, I, I mean, that didn't actually, I mean, yes, you could say, like, in terms of DNA, but, like, I, I think that they're, they are different enough culturally that it's a, I mean, a legitimate concern, I guess you could say, if you're very interested in keeping Japan pure. Mm -hmm. You may be getting at the uh, speculation that the history of the uh, ruling family might originally come from Korea. Right, exactly. Like the, we talked early on about how there have been no um, archaeological investigations of the royal tombs, and some people think it might be because they're afraid to see what's inside. And this idea that um, when the Uyoi people came, they may have come from Korea or the Chinese mainland. Um, and so, in that sense, pure Japanese actually comes from Korea in some sense, so it's kind of odd. And then, so the last part, what about the Okinawans? You know, the other end from the... I guess in terms of um, about why they're discriminated against, they've been historically separate mm -hmm. from Japan's history. Southernmost island, uh, different dialect of Japanese, yeah. uh, different culture and customs. Right. And in terms of effect to this uh, to society, we were unsure if they're, they, they are full-blooded Japanese ethnic, is that correct? 
Um, I, I believe it said in there that he was kind of vague about it, but he said that he kind of makes some claim that they might also be related to the Yoy or to the Ainu, but that yeah. they're distinct from... Did you have maybe they're along with the Ainu, that's right. Right, so maybe they're not quite as separate as the Ainu, but they're also not ethnically Ainu. So in terms of the threat, I guess that, um, and also just culturally threatening um, right. to the Japanese norms. Um, and I guess it's ironic because you know, they're definitely Japanese. They right. just happen to be um, on an island that's a lot different than the rest of Japan. And it's still one of the most military bases. It's marketed as kind of this tropical, touristy destination. Right. So they're mainland Japanese. Yeah. I mean, I think kind of the main thing is, is like you said, they were independent up until just over 200 years ago. So, um, you know, if you're going to take the kind of 19th century nationalist claim of a nation as one language, one ethnicity, and one geographical, geographically con contiguous area, then it's like, well, we kind of had that until 200 years ago when you came and took us over. So, um, you know, back then, um, early, I think it was before the Meiji, they were paying tribute to both China and Japan and functioning independently, so. There was uh, also like the military suicides during World War II, and in the article it was saying how like World War II exacerbated like the bitterness towards Japan mm -hmm. and made things worse instead of like, like helping them, you know, be absorbed nationally. Right, yeah. And then plus the fact that like, okay, first Japan comes and takes over, and now the U.S. occupation comes, and it wasn't until um, about 20 years after the mainland Japan occupation was over that um, that Okinawa was officially returned to Japan and then even it's now... It's questionable whether you exactly. Right, yeah. So, okay. Well, um, we've got about five minutes left.